You're listening to Radio New Vegas, your little jukebox in the Mojave wasteland. I am Mr. New Vegas, and I'm here for you. We've got some news for you coming right up. The TRJ did strike back. It has been six years since the release of Star Wars Episode Eight, and many have, thus far, not managed to move on from the event. Discontent spreads across the galaxy as those with nothing to say speak the loudest, highlighting just how little value they have to contribute to the general discourse. Among these warriors of easily targetable sludge arrives a great and powerful tumor, whose rancid opinions and lack of personal credibility hang over the populace like a fog of perpetual torment. Robot Head. Recently, he has decided to attack the writing of a beloved Star Wars TV show, Andor, a shining beacon of craftsmanship that has yet to succumb to the vile mediocrity of its predecessors. Still, despite standing triumphantly above the slop and gunk, Robot Head has deemed this great piece of content as beneath him, not even worthy of his attention, to be forgotten and placed within the same sphere of disease as the rest of this tragic franchise, all because he is incapable of letting go of the past. Will this dastardly, mentally fragmented android be able to look past his, quite frankly, limited and underdeveloped personal vendetta against this modern Star Wars franchise? Will his deeply rooted and very clearly unbiased hatred of this franchise welcome him to an unyielding spew of visceral garbage and noxious assumptions. Hello my lovelies, Shandy here, currently searching the forest moon of Endo for the frisbee that Lawrence threw during our lunch break. What it is, soul brother? Star Wars is pretty terrible. Not all of it, just most of it. For the longest time, the franchise has really been unable to recapture that lightning in a bottle which was present in the first two films. I say the first two because most people can agree that the third one had a few issues, even if it was still a satisfying ending to the saga. And for the majority of people who saw these films and thought, hey, that was pretty neat. They were unable to do that thing again that I just said that they did with their mouths for a very long time. The only people who have said that thing I just said that they did with their mouths were the people who exposed themselves to some of the expanded material found in comic books, novels, and video games. At least, well, the people who were honest, because unfortunately we still had a few people saying things like this. I am a prequel fanboy, and f proud of it. I appreciate the prequels in ways most people do not or simply don't care to. I don't feel shame for admitting that the prequels are lovable movies filled with awesome moments and a compelling story, unlike a lot of other YouTubers who made their careers by following in Plinkett's footsteps, who still think it's called cool the sh** on these movies. In which the less a person knows about a subject, the more they feel that they're an expert. If a person is so ignorant that they're unable to conceptualize what they don't know, they believe they know everything. I think this explains almost all of the internet criticism about the prequels. But so many people hate the prequels, you say. Surely they must have some valid points. Well, no. Not really. No. You should go back, watch the movie again, write notes, assess context and whatnot. Prequel haters don't do that. Prequel haters get opinion from some idiot's faulty perspective on the internet. Again and again. And they never stop to watch the movies for themselves and just decide to bash them. And they actually only watch the movies around the idea of bashing it, instead of maybe trying to enjoy them. They can't assess them without the mentality of ripping them apart. But they never ever stop to think whether it's just or if it's actually unfair. Fair. You see, it's somehow become a controversial opinion to suggest that these three prequel films are actually quite horrendous, for a very wide variety of reasons. They were panned on release, made fun of relentlessly, and are still heavily mocked to this day, despite the vapid amount of prequel defenders that exist. On the opposite side of the spectrum, you have the sequel trilogy. The first one was generally thought to be okay upon release. You know, it, it was alright. Not actually, though it's quite horrific too. But people didn't think this initially, and for the first time in a very long time, it felt like we would be getting good Star Wars content again. Then everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. This movie, this piece of right here, caused such a massive stink upon its release that it essentially fractured the entire Star Wars fandom into shards that have yet to be put back together, and for good reason. This movie was pathetic. 
It deserves all of the hate that it received and all of the hate that it continues to receive to this day. But something else happened. This film managed to spawn a variety of YouTube channels who dedicated their time on this platform to talking about media, especially about TLJ. Because of how genuinely terrible this film was and because of how incredibly easy it was to deconstruct and criticize, it meant that many of these up and coming tubers managed to explode in popularity. Some of them are actually quite good and went on to create successful channels that delve into very interesting and nuanced discussions around media. And some of them were Robot Head. A member of the Boomer Tuber Brigade who rode the coattails of TLJ hate to rising popularity and have yet to come off that ride. Despite repeatedly just spamming out the same low effort, tepid trollop you see with other similar channels, and for forming incredibly terrible opinions all around. If you think I'm being malicious or I'm just trying to poison the weather before we get started, then please do be aware of something. This video that I'm about to cover, and that some of you may be witnessing for the first time, I hate it. I'm not even trying to be facetious either, I genuinely despise this video. It made me both really angry and really confused because it's just a- it's just fucking atrocious. Like actually sinfully shite. A complete waste of energy and time. And because I had to be exposed to this, it means you do too. We are going to suffer together, because that is what families do. Alright, enough delaying the inevitable, let's just get straight into it shall we? And all the adult version of Star Wars is here, which means flashbacks, everything moving at a glacial pace. And of course, we have to start in a brothel. I don't want Ghani. Behave. Only 10 seconds in and we already have a very loaded sentence. I think we should start this off by explaining what Andor as a show is before we dig into the other points. Andor is a Star Wars prequel series set five years before the events of Rogue One, which itself was a prequel story set before Episode 4, A New Hope. The series follows a multitude of interesting and well-realized characters, but the main focus is on Cassian Andor, a scrapyard worker from a colony planet named Ferex. The show follows Cassian as he tries to search for his long-lost sister, which inevitably gets him in trouble with the law, and proceeds to spiral out of control far worse than he could have possibly imagined. It's a show which starts off slower than most Disney or Star Wars content, but it very quickly builds up momentum and has some of the absolute best payoffs of any piece of Star Wars media. The show is something that I would consider to be a must watch and comes highly recommended by many of those who have taken the time to view it. With that said, does that mean that this is the adult Star Wars show? Well, firstly, we would need to discuss what the term adult means in this context. Considering Robot Head brings up the series usage of a brothel in his opening segment, we could start by exploring the idea that Andor is adult in its usage of explicit media, meaning violence, sex, drugs, or other difficult to view scenes like prolonged torture. And if this is the metric, then I would say that Andor does fit some of this criteria. The show features many scenes that include violence, psychological and physical torture, implied sexual intercourse, and even some explicit language. Vix has nothing to do with but this. then who told these primo bastards about Canary? However, the show also mentions other avenues of adult-related subjects such as gambling, alcohol, arranged marriage, war, and financial embezzlement. But do these attributes of the show make it intrinsically more adult by nature compared to something like The OT? A series which features violence, psychological and physical torture, implied sexual intercourse, and even some explicit language. Half-witted, scruffy-looking nerf herder. Who's scruffy looking? Considering that Andor takes place in a franchise which more or less has had the same level of approachability since its conception, with each film, show, and game being able to be enjoyed by people of all ages, it would be rather odd of Robot Head to signal this show out for being a little bit more spicy with its content, would it not? Then again, I am jumping to conclusions, so we would just need to wait and see. Moving on to his mentioning of flashbacks and everything moving at a glacial pace, as mentioned before, Andor does start off as more of a slow burn compared to other Star Wars media but it quickly picks up pace once the ball gets rolling. As shown, it has the audience spending a lot of time with its vast array of side characters, getting to know them and allowing us to understand all of their own unique personalities and motivations for why they pursue their respective goals. It means that when stuff does happen on screen, we are more likely to care about why stuff is happening as opposed to what is happening. One of the tools that the creators of Andor employ to assist in this process is the utilization of flashbacks. These delve into Andor's childhood on his home world of Canari, and while it does explore his upbringing and introduces how he met his adoptive mother, these flashbacks are also 
useful for establishing parallels to many of the situations he faces in his present predicament. Arguably the best example of his usage of flashbacks and the parallels would be the end of episode 3, when Luthen rescues Andor from Ferex, after they fall out with Cyril and his men. Cyril is a member of the same police unit from Molana 1 as the two men Andor killed in the first episode. He was investigating their murder which led to a confrontation with Andor in episode 3, thus requiring Luthen to rescue him since he was an interested third party. What both of these segments show is that Cassian has been put into a position that is far and away out of his control, requiring the assistance of others in order to get him out of trouble. It shows you a clear connection between his current mentality of always being on the run, always moving, and how he was raised to think that way initially, adding to the tone of overall stress and anxiety the first arc tends to cover. This is also an element that gets enveloped in further detail throughout the rest of the show, delving more into his personal backstory and how that ties into his current philosophy and way of thinking. It is also a great way of showing the overall oppressive nature of the Empire and how it has been a constant spur for the rebellious nature of those under oppression. I will discuss the importance of these flashbacks more as the video continues, but for now I just wanted to lay some groundwork for arguments that are to come as we continue down this wretched road. This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the only one platform to build your online presence. I hope it comes as no surprise to anyone that I will be skipping the sponsored segments of this video. If anyone thinks I'm intentionally trying to misrepresent Tobot Head by removing segments of this video, the link will be present in the description so you can see for yourself if I'm being disingenuous. And if you're intending on visiting his channel or his video, then please be civilized. Don't go there to intentionally spread vitriol or harass him. Behave. But before we discuss Hollywood's morals, or lack thereof, let's discuss the entertainment value of Andor. Trigger warning ahead, be prepared to defend yourself from Roboat Head's understanding of entertainment value. Andor looks a thousand times better than most of Disney's Star Wars content. Correct. The low point, of course, being, sadly, the Kenobi show. Yes, ever since the producers announced they weren't going to use the stagecraft large projection screens that Lucasfilm has been relying on for all of their Disney Plus content, I've been interested to see how this show would look, because those screens in the right hands can look amazing. In the wrong hands, which is most of the time, it makes scenes look oddly framed and forces everything to look highly artificial. But thankfully, a lot of this show looks amazing. I would agree, but not for most of it. I'd argue that just the show looks amazing. Like... All of it. Which it should for 15 to 25 million dollars per episode. You see Andor was shot on location in the UK and at the classic Pinewood Studios. Which means we also happily get a lot of British accents. Which is a nice change and feels like old times. Yes, it also means that many of the actors involved are experienced theatre actors, leading to some great performances, if not just the best out of any piece of Star Wars media. The show is a real treat for that sort of thing. Everything looks and feels like it was shot by a professional with actual talent. Nicely framed shots, better lighting, interesting ideas, even things we haven't seen before, which is highly unusual for this franchise. I couldn't have been the only one watching this who was just waiting for the butt to pop up, eventually. Granted, he's not wrong so far. The show looks absolutely immaculate, and there was a lot of attention to detail given by a crew of people who were very passionate about what they were making. Andor was a splendor to behold with some breathtaking visuals, and if he only spoke about the show's visuals, then I'd probably have considered this to be a good video. Especially if he went into any sort of depth about the filmmaking presence, such as the fact that Ferex was a completely practical set, according to Variety.com. 80 to 85% of the scenes in Ferex were shot in the back lot, a functional space where doors and windows open into usable space. An immensely impressive endeavor which has gone a long way into creating an immersive and believable environment for this town. It really shows that a lot of faith was put into the prop and practical effects departments rather than just being overly reliant on VFX and post-production like a lot of other shows and films. But as you may well know, Robot Head didn't just talk about the visuals. We even get a droid with an interesting personality who feels like he's straight out of silent running and something very rare in modern star wars a mostly good cast that can project feelings and emotion without screaming and they're actually a pleasure to watch it all feels a bit wrong there it is and the feeling of it being a bit wrong has nothing to do with it being surprisingly well executed it all feels a bit wrong because it doesn't feel anything like star wars citation needed. I'm going to wait for more clarification on your end as to what you mean when you say that the show doesn't feel like Star Wars since that term could mean a variety of different things. From the use of force and lightsabers to the applications of screws and bricks, there is a range of different definitions one could use to distinguish what they understand to be a lack of connection to prior content. I'm sure it will be well thought out and very insightful. Which is a bit of a problem when you're supposedly making Star Wars content. In what way? 
How is creating a piece of content that you yourself have just admitted to being well-written, well-made, and well-acted problematic because it doesn't fit your understanding of what Star Wars media is? Couldn't this be viewed as an expansion of the IP, delivering fresh and exciting views on a universe as a whole from a group of people that don't really get represented all too much? At least represented well, despite making up a rather important segment of the OT? Because as you will quite rightly remember, the majority of the cast for those movies were just normal people trying to secure their freedom against their oppressive and fascist empire. A message that can be universal universally understood without getting into the Force-related antics and shenanigans. Especially when the Force and Jedi as a whole have been done to death a number of times over the last few years thanks to the implementation of shows like The Clone Wars, Rebels, Tales of the Jedi, Visions, The Mandalorian, Kenobi, and even more with the currently released Ahsoka series. A piece of piss show that deserves to die via electric squid throttling. Maybe taking a step away from the gimmick and focusing more on the people that make up these places could be beneficial to this franchise. I'm saying this like it hasn't already, that the the impact the show has had on many of its viewers has not already allowed them to open their eyes to the possibilities of good Star Wars content again. Yeah, uh, Alex. I didn't like it. Uh, surprise, surprise. I don't I, like even the opening action sequence was kind of sloppy. Uh, the kid has long hair, then he doesn't have long hair, then he's got long hair, then he doesn't have long hair. There's like these <laughs> little they, Mando kid that they're yeah, doing a ceremony. They, for. There's there's clearly like a stunt double that gets thrown in there, but the, like there's all these quick cuts where like the hair is coming, popping back, and disappearing. A and I don't kid. and I don't like in any piece of media where they make a powerful group of people look like fucking idiots to make the main character look powerful. You had twenty at least twenty Mandalorians. Like, not these, doing these, a really good job yeah. fighting a giant turtle monster. Those Mandalorians are fucking terrible. And so, yeah, and Seriously? You have, like, all this reverence for, like, the old ways and shit, and nobody bothers to just, I don't know, go there? Well, they said it was bad. And they're like, I believe you. Okay. I, I won't, believe, I won't believe you. Though my whole religion yeah, is okay. based on being at the planet yeah. and the waters and the... <sighs> uh, even the, he's fighting the okay. I, IG droid and it's like got no arms that and he's having trouble. That was embarrassing. And, and so that like, whole scene was cringe. And so it's like, I don't like the storytelling elements. I think there's fun. I'm, you're having fun with it because it's dumb, but I don't want it to be OJ movie dumb fun. <laughs> yeah. I want it to be Mandalorian it's dumb fun. fun I think fun. what's happening here oh. is we got a little used to the Andor fucking strong writing, strong plot, interesting intrigue, shit makes sense sense uh we take that shit for granted and mando here is feeling like a, i don't know saturday morning cartoon kid show uh i don't really remember it feeling much like this in season one maybe a little season two but uh -oh. the mandalorian has no ending plan says john favaro it's not like there's a finale that we're building to and that is what we were worried about just continuing on nowhere to go Ugh. I hate that shit. Yeah. That's Boy, did I get excited when we didn't start in some shitty town? I mean, the looks all straight out of other movies, and there's not one original idea, but still, we we're in a city and not another horrible, dirty little town. Um, yeah, I guess. The show is being consistent with the time period it takes place in, so it would want to look reminiscent of the other films. I don't see the need to bring up lack of originality, since it should be a good thing that the show is consistent in its presentation, right? Like... Am, am I insane for thinking that's a good thing? Well, that didn't last long. How dare? Ferrix is quite well maintained, thank you very much. I will not be accepting the slander. So why doesn't it feel like Star Wars? Star Wars was a classic tale of good and evil, wrapped in a fantasy sci-fi adventure. And fantasy being the important bit, Star Wars is closer in tone to a wizard and dragon adventure than it is to wormholes and scientific problems. Ah, uh, I see. So we can classify basically anything how we want it, if we ignore the other elements attached to it. So, for example, I can consider Terminator 2 to be a buddy comedy-esque film since the relationship and banter between John Connor and the T-800 are the important parts, with Terminator 2 being closer to Rush Hour than science and time travel. See, I'm allowed to say these things because I said it with an air of certainty and didn't back up any of my statements, because I'm relying on my audience to believe everything I say. Star Wars is, as you yourself just said, a fantasy sci-fi adventure, and the film delves into a lot of the sci-fi elements. The main method of transportation across the galaxy relies on hyperspace travel, which is a sci-fi concept. The main weapons used are laser swords and blasters. The bad guy stronghold is a space station with a planet-wiping death beam attached to it. None of this screams wizards and dragons to me. The main antagonist even gets made fun of by a low-level admiral or general or something for still believing in his religion 
religion. Clearly people in this universe are not as focused on space voodoo as people in more traditional fantasy settings are. And despite some characters believing in aspects of wizardry, they still rely on their own tools and wits to get themselves out of trouble and to continue their battle against the Empire. Which is why these films have both of these tags. It's because they explore both themes. You can't just get rid of half of the film's established setting just because you think magic is cool. You know, I hate to break this to a lot of people, but another thing about the Star Wars universe is that it isn't real. What? No way. The locations aren't real. The events aren't real. Whoa, whoa, wait. Enhance that footage. Enhance, 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 enhance. Thank you. Continue. The events aren't real. I have to explain this because a lot of people like to say things like, I want to know more about the side characters in Star Wars. What the fuck? Or I want more Star Wars without the annoying Jedi and Sith. As if Star Wars is a real place and these other amazing stories are sitting there waiting to be discovered. It's such a bizarre way to look at art and creativity and how fiction works. But like, that's exactly how it works though. People see inspiration in a piece of art, whether it's a painting or a song or a character they really liked and get to work making something that features them. Nathan Drake, as an example, takes heavy inspiration from characters like Lara Croft and Indiana Jones, despite them not being real. Someone had an idea for a story to tell involving these characters or characters like them, and as a result we got four games featuring the character of Nathan Drake. A more direct example that is applicable to Andor specifically would be Better Call Saul, a prequel series for Breaking bad featuring a side character as the main lead. Now the thing that makes Better Call Saul interesting is that it barely features any of the main plot points of the first series, and strictly follows a new set of characters for the majority of its runtime, bringing back fan favourites from the original show when nearing the end of its runtime. This is to more directly tie it to the original show, and as a result gives these characters more depth and the audience a broader understanding of how they operate, which can lead to greater appreciation for the original show that they featured in. Now Better Call Saul didn't need to be made, Jimmy McGill's story wasn't just sitting sitting there waiting to be discovered. Instead what happened was a fan favourite side character who had a lot of interesting potential backstory to delve into, explaining how they got their particular business, their relationship with their colleagues, and what it would all mean for them once all was said and done, was given a means of exploring their aforementioned potential stories and it was expanded upon over several years and several seasons of television. And as a result, Better Call Saul became a highly revered and respected series of television, leaving many to wonder if it was better than the original show. People don't realise the potential of the work they have laid out before them and many would view an exploration of these side characters as just trying to milk something which was already proven to be popular. But every once in a while we manage to get something truly special, where the talent and care present during the creation of these properties manages to captivate an entire audience who didn't know what they wanted until it was already in front of them. What you view as a strange methodology, others see opportunities that can expand and even sometimes revitalize franchises long thought to be dead. The issue isn't the desire to want to explore these side characters, it's the ability to do it with a level of care and skill that would warrant its creation in the first place. Else you do just end up with another Kenobi show. The Star Wars side stories these people think would be fascinating just don't exist. I think you are flat out wrong to be honest. What does exist are many love books that would make for great content. Well, what the fuck do you think these books are if not just side stories to the original films, you amputated goose? Writers that understood the world of Star Wars and weren't trying to fight against it, which is very different to what we're getting today. But what am I thinking? Of course Andor is the story everyone wants. Literally, yes. Basically... Uh, I really appreciated the extended length. You, 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 you get room to breathe. You get time for characters to settle in, learn their motivations, to really feel like you're a part of the world. In many ways, this felt a little bit like it was taking some cues from Andor. So I'm glad to see some kind of carryover. According to the Direct.com, which records Disney's most viewed shows of 2022, Andor was the fourth most popular show to watch on Disney Plus behind the likes of The Owl House, a show currently on its third season, The Mandalorian, a show currently on its third season, and The Simpsons, a show currently on its 303rd season. The fact that Andor was able to compete with these shows while being significantly higher than other Star Wars media indicates to me that it generally is actually a story that a lot of people wanted. You goof. When we get to camp, we're going to tell them this was my idea and we've been planning it all the while. If you change that in any way, you and I are going to have a big problem.
You know, I don't really understand what kind of connection this clip is supposed to have with his last point. Perhaps he's trying to highlight how Cassian is being talked down to by Vex in this scene, despite being the main character. Or maybe he's trying to say something a bit spicier without being so direct about it. Whatever it may be, I'm still confused because if you watch the scene in full context, it makes perfect sense for Vex to be as annoyed and commanding in this scene as she is in the clip. At the start of the scene, she's talking to Luthan, who wants Andor to join her group. Vex is in charge of organizing a heist on the Empire-controlled planet of Aldani, and has been organizing this plan for months, monitoring every enemy placement, pattern of movement, security codes, and the like, all the while living off of bare necessities with a ragtag group of other believers in the cause. Now only a few days away from actually participating in the heist, she has a random guy joining the crew and has to pretend like he was part of the operation the entire time so as to avoid scattering the core group who are already nervous about the plan as is. It sets up a great bit of character introduction as Andor, or at this point, Clem, has to bluff his way through a series of questions about who he is and why he is there in order to avoid suspicion, only to climax in an outright confrontation mere hours before the high starts. The Aldani arc is regularly referred to as the best arc in the show, and it's not hard to understand why when even a small conversation around the principles of freedom with a character we were introduced to an episode ago is more interesting and more deeply developed than the vast majority of mainstream Star Wars content to date. It makes his fate at the end of episode 6 significantly more impactful because of how likable he became during his first two episodes. A lot of that character development is only possible because of this scene with Vex. And if you want to complain about it, then you need to give a good reason why it's bad. I'm always perplexed when people say they want Star Wars to move away from the Jedi and the Force. As if Star Wars has more to offer. Small PP Star Wars fan detected. The Jedi and the Force are the main thing that separates Star Wars from a lot of other mundane sci-fi. Ah uh, yes, I'm sure the interesting creature designs, vast array of planets, specifically unique art style, over the top action, immersive music and generally good writing had absolutely nothing to do with the fact that Star Wars became as popular as it did. It was literally just the laser swords. And even if that was true, why does that mean it always has to be that way? Star Wars as an IP is large enough where it can warrant a look at other aspects of its universe without fear of crumbling. And judging by how positively reviewed Andor was as a whole, ignoring these idiots, people seem to want more of this, not less. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Luminous beings are we, not this crude matter. And look what you get when they do remove it completely. And look what you get when you see just a hint of it. This might be a hot take, or maybe people have actually moved on, but this scene of Luke killing all these droids is hot key jangling garbage which tries to distract you from just how bad this episode is as a whole. And why are you using Book of Boba Fett as an example of what happens when Star Wars moves away from the Jedi and the Force? which isn't even true by the way. When you have a show which you have already admitted to being good in multiple different ways, right here. It's almost like you are trying to judge Andor's quality based on what has come before, which is just really fucking stupid. Plus, Disney has already spent their whole time racing away from the Jedi and the Sith. Uh, no. You are literally showing two Jedi on screen right now. Granted, Jake Skywalker is a bit at odds with who he used to be at this current moment in time, but they are still Jedi. The movie has multiple Jedi fight scenes, usages of the Force. Hell, a big point for its story is how the Jedi need to return and that Luke was wrong for leaving, you stupid git. It's time for the Jedi to end. Rogue One, no Jedi. It's almost as if the film was entirely focused on the group of people who were trying to steal the Death Star plans we saw at the start of A New Hope. You know, the movie where there was only one Jedi. And I'm so thankful that you managed to miss out on Darth Vader's appearance, despite him having a version of the exact same scene we saw Luke having at the end of Mando Season 2, which you just highlighted as a good usage of the Jedi and the Force. Solo a Star Wars story, no Jedi. Oh yeah, I wonder why. <laughs> Pokey religions and ancient weapons are no match for a good blaster at your side, kid. You don't believe in the Force, do you? Kid, I've flown from one side of this galaxy to the other. I've seen a lot of strange stuff, but I've never seen anything to make me believe there's one all-powerful Force controlling everything. There's no mystical energy field that controls my destiny. The sequels, fake Jedi. This... This person doesn't know what the hell he's doing! Mandalorian, minimal Jedi. The literal first fucking episode ends with Mando finding a Force-sensitive child, you sterilized tampon. Boba Fett, no Jedi. Thank fuck, we really didn't need any Jedi for the show. It was bad enough already. It didn't need to get worse. Obi-Wan, Dollar Store Sith. 
Wait, wh- wh- you, you just spent the last uh, 10 seconds complaining about a lack of Jedi in your Star Wars media, and now you have an entire show focused around the main fucking Jedi, and your issue was with how the Sith were represented? Even though Darth fucking Vader makes an appearance and has a few fight scenes with Kenobi? Are, are you shitting in my breakfast, you galvanized leather shoe? Andor, no Jedi. <laughs> And when the Disney shows do attempt anything with the Jedi or Force, people lose their fucking minds with joy, no matter how minimal or token the scene is. Yes, it's almost like key jangling and throwing stuff from your childhood directly into your face with the grace and care of a falling asteroid is a common and regularly used tactic by these studios because they know it makes them money. Because people are gremlins for this sort of thing. This should not be an indicator of something Disney should keep doing, else you do end up getting films like Indiana Jones and The Dial of Destiny, a critical and commercial flop of a film which you have gone on record for thinking is bad. It's the same reaction when we get a hint of the fantasy element. All I'm going to say is just citation needed. Man, I think Ahsoka and the Mandalorian is the only time they have come close to recapturing the true fantasy feel of Star Wars. But for some reason, modern Lucasfilm are too arrogant or too stupid to understand this. So they keep trying to move away from the things that people love about Star Wars. So uncivilized. I really hope the new Indiana Jones has more school politics and more talking and less adventure. And please, can we move on from all that archaeological crap? Because I'd like to know more about the side characters, like Mutt. Please, Disney, an adult show where Mutt visits every brothel in Tijuana. Oh yeah, that's the thing people don't want more of. Learning about their characters and the world that they are a part of. Especially Star Wars fans, who aren't interested in the expanded lore and history of the Force, and the Jedi, and the Sith. Nah nah nah, people really didn't care about that sort of stuff, did they? Why not Back to the Future, but with less time travel? I will take things that nobody has asked for for $100, Alex. Maybe we could see how Marty's uncle ended up in jail. Maybe it could be brothel related. The original Jurassic Park is a classic. Why not a backstory to the guy who died on the toilet. Seeing how he became a lawyer would be very slow and boring. And apparently, that's perfect grown-up entertainment. Hey, if it's anything like Better Call Saul, then that spin-off would be a hit. Just saying. Can we have new Star Trek with all the interesting writing removed and more dumb over-the-top action force tin? Oh dear, that one's already happened. I just need you to be brave for a few more minutes. You with me? I want to highlight something off with this example. His previous point was about focusing on a character that would be boring compared to the dinosaurs. Typically his entire shtick here has been highlighting things people enjoyed about these particular films which happen to be the exciting bits, like with Indiana Jones and his retrieval of ancient artifacts or fighting off Nazis. Back to the Future, it was time travel and all the shenanigans that accompanied it. With Jurassic Park, it's, well, it's the Munchie Boys. But for Star Trek, it's actually the exact opposite. Star Trek fans have held the original show and the next generation in high regard because of their writing and characters, specifically the dialogues that were held. Nobody really praised them for their action, especially the original show. They cared about the questions that these shows raised, the answers that were given and the road to getting them. The entertainment value to be had was actually what you just considered to be the boring parts for these other films, and yet you just complained about the newer films and shows catering towards having more action. So which is it? Should these films have more or less boring parts to make sure that your jimmies aren't rustled when there isn't a loud noise on screen? Keep in mind that I've seen at least two of these examples and both of them have really good scenes involving characters just talking to one another. You could actually argue that they would both be inferior films if these talking scenes didn't exist. The reason why is because of how bland their actions will come across if we don't have the reasoning behind it. Why does Indy try to find the Cup of Christ in The Last Crusade? Why does Ian Malcolm dislike the idea of dinosaurs returning to the realm of the living? Why do I want to bang Marty? These are all questions that have answers as long as you listen to the dialogue. The same thing can and should be said about Star Wars, else you just get another boring action sci-fi fantasy film. And don't pretend like that's not true, this scene wouldn't have hit nearly as hard if we didn't have Vader and Luke talking to each other before they got here. You are just bad at making points. In the history of cinema, most, and by a large margin, most films were made for the grown-ups. 
And up to a couple of years ago, strip joints and brothels were reserved for actual adult content. And are you just going to pretend like that isn't still the case today, you colossal fucking Dumberton? But Pretty Woman changed all that. All of a sudden, streetwalkers didn't smell like a combination of cheap perfume and sweat, didn't have visible track marks, and oddly, still had all their own teeth. Well, Julia Roberts always looks like she's always got an extra set of teeth shoved in there, so it's hard to tell. <laughs> I'm not sexist. Being sexist is wrong. Yeah. And being wrong is for women. <laughs> so now every bloody show out of America has to visit a strip joint or a brothel, which is fine if the entertainment doesn't fall under a name that has been marketed to kids and families for the past 40 years. Huh. You're going to regret this. Oh. What's a brothel? So yes, again, for what keeps coming up when reviewing Disney content, we see the concerning mentality of the modern Hollywood. We have adult themes forced into a show that is purely made to attract kids and families to the Disney streaming service. We do have a lovely lady here tonight from Tahina who's got those big dark eyes you're looking for. The scene is not forced in though. It's, it's not meant to meet a quota for number of brothels or exotic dancers shown on screen. The purpose of this scene is to establish character traits and motivations for our lead and sets up future plot points that are incredibly important to the broader story of Andor. Not to mention that when it comes to overall display of this establishment, it is far tamer and far more child-friendly when compared to even older Star Wars content. If you don't know what this establishment was, I very much doubt that you would figure that out as a child, considering how little there is to go on here. Then you need to consider that the time spent in this place is relatively short for how long the episode is as a whole. We don't see open acts of sexuality being displayed on screen. The dialogue that's present between these two characters is rather vague and gives you a light idea of what this establishment offers. And for all that it really matters, this place could just serve as a pub for those who aren't interested in exploring the other avenues of comfort provided by these lovely ladies. I also don't believe that your intentions are strictly focused on the viewing betterment of children. Call me bad faith if you'd like. Like, but judging by how far-fetched the stretch of a criticism comes off, I'm far more likely to believe that you just didn't like the show, whether it be for superficial reasons or because you genuinely are just that stupid, and you try to look for the most outlandish reasoning for not liking it in order to justify your taste in media, and judging by your comment section, I'm not the only one. I don't want Ghani. Behave. And the brothel scene added absolutely nothing to the story. I'm looking for my sister. He says directly before playing a clip of the main character giving his reasoning for why he is here. Do you even edit your own content? A story we're going to forget about in five minutes. Literally, four episodes in and he hasn't mentioned his sister again. Guys, guys. This is important. Let's check it out. There's no suspect at this point. We have some excellent leads. A human with dark features asking about a canary girl who might have been working at the establishment. Are there are no witnesses to the actual crime. It's usually quite busy there. Hope he has name on the time scan. Ferrex. Yes, sir. We've been working on it. Canary human males on Ferrex. I'm afraid that's a blank, sir. What? Oh, we have got an imperial census. How old is it? This is six years ago. That's an eternity. There's not a lot about canary, sir. It's fairly obscure. That should make it easier. We'll have to put the word out. Put out a bulletin. Canary human men wanted for questioning. Slam the channels, flood it. Set up a desk here to monitor anything that comes in. Let's go! Cassian Andor. That says he's from Fest. This was a tip call, right? Probably someone messing with us. I don't see Canary here. Hold on. I have an image. Check the database. See if there's anything about Canary. We have a suspect? 
Not sure yet. We're about to get an image. Mm-hmm. Good. Cassian Andor. Not a recent image, but the best we've got. He may not appear to be a formidable opponent, but two of our men are dead having made that mistake. But I'm not done yet! And just one more thing, just stop searching for your sister. It's a fantasy. There were no survivors on Canari. What happened there was not your responsibility. You were a child. Let it go. Are you in all the way? Let's get to it. Now a little break to talk about our favorite sponsor, Squarespace. Nah, I think I'm good. Instead, I'll just briefly talk a bit more about why these two scenes are important and why they break apart the narrative you just tried to spin about the bar scene being unimportant. The first scene has our main antagonist for the first three episodes, Cyril. Being informed by his commanding officer that Andor was looking for a Canary girl who was working at this establishment. This piece of information ends up being Cyril's biggest lead because directly after this meeting, he begins an investigation of his own, leading to him questioning the service girl Ander was speaking with. She confirms with him that Ander was looking for a girl from Canari and that this girl was his sister, which gives Cyril his second biggest piece of information. By knowing that Cassian is a human male from Canari with dark features and a beard, it means he can place out a description across nearby planets within the same system, which allows local residents to report any news if they find someone who matches the description. Now because of how guarded Cassian is about his origins on Canari, most people wouldn't have suspected it was him, save for literally one or two people. People, he trusted with that information. Unfortunately for Cassian, one of those people did let that information slip, and due to a personal grievance this person had with Cassian, it led to them reporting him to Cyril and his team, which allows the final confrontation at the end of episode 3 to kick off. And due to the conclusion of the struggle, it then leads to Cassian becoming a member of Luthan's heist team on Aldani due to his skills and experience, as well as Cassian being promised a sum of the money if he was successful. These are two very significant arcs, and the Aldani arc is arguably some of, if not the best, Star Wars content currently available, at least in video format. And none of this would have been possible if it were not for the fact that Cassian mentioned his sister during the scene you explicitly said was of no value. It was a starting point, an inciting incident, a connective thread that allowed these events to happen. It's a piece of information that leads Cyril to finding another piece, until he eventually locates where Cassian is living. And with Andor as a show leaning very heavily into its espionage setting, Having a character like Cyril be able to piece together a web of information based off of one or two clues really does excellent work in making his character stand out as a competent and driven individual rather than just another generic Imperial officer or battle droid. Here's what we'll do, Mr. Khan. You'll stop filing requests for Andor. Anticipating that, I will inform the Bureau of Standards that you were of service to the Empire today. I was a good deputy inspector. That was very good. I solved a double murder and found the killer in two days. It was overly ambitious, yes, but time was slipping away and the opportunity was real. Service to the Empire. You just said it. Can one ever be too aggressive in preserving order? I didn't deserve what happened. I wish you luck. I'm running late. It's clear you need Andor in order to find his partner. It's also clear that whatever this is is more important than the death of two corporate security guards. It could be a valuable asset going forward. Raise the alarm. One more time, and it won't be me you're speaking to. This is the kind of character work that has been missing from Star Wars for ages. And you just want to throw it away because you don't understand what makes these sorts of scenes important to the grander narrative, you dysfunctional lamplight. The second scene isn't nearly as important as the first, but it still highlights a good bit of character for Marva. She knows that Cassian is trying to find himself a life that is free from the grip of the Empire after having lost so much to them. As such, she asks him to forget about his sister because of the trouble she knows he will cause looking for her, especially since the entire first arc of the show, as well as their initial on-screen argument, began as a result of Cassian trying to look for his sister, causing quite a commotion in his wake. It shows that she cares about him quite a lot and doesn't want to see him lose himself in a pursuit of a person who may very likely be dead. I just felt like mentioning this to subvert the argument of this plot point not being mentioned again in the future. And or sister who he's trying to find 
mind, could have been working as a dish hand or a cleaner or a bartender or a thousand other jobs and would have made zero difference to the story. But no, our new Star Wars family entertainment starts with Andor discussing how his sister took money for shoving bits of other people and I'm guessing aliens into her regions. Except you don't know if that's true or not. She may well have been a cook or a bar lady, or a cleaner, a nurse, a member of security, or hell, she might have been in charge of the fucking register. You don't actually know. All you know is that she worked in an establishment that features women of the night, and you just assume that she also partook in those activities. And, let's say for argument's sake, that she did. That that was the only way she could make money in the system. Why would that be a problem? Especially if she isn't a local. She potentially doesn't speak basic and she desperately needs money. There aren't that many professions that cater towards people with such a limited toolkit in this universe, especially since many faculties have protocol droids that do half of these jobs anyways. For this scenario, I'm assuming she doesn't speak basic because she comes from a planet that didn't speak it, and the only reason Cassia knows it is because he was rescued by Marva. If this doesn't end up being true in Season 2, then feel free to dismiss this point. Not to mention that Star Wars isn't exactly shy when it comes to portraying women in particular situations that they wouldn't have necessarily chosen for themselves. It's not like the slave trade is a real and prosperous market in this universe, that many people would be sold into service simply because other people had control over them, right? Especially not in a time period where the Empire is as corrupt and immoral as even the most dedicated criminal organizations, right? And like I said in the last video, I'm Australian. It's virtually impossible to offend me. Jesus Christ, get that fucking thing out of here, you mad bastard! I'm going to try and get that clip into every video. If you're really an Australian, then where's your forklift license? Hi Viz, and hard hat mate. Smokers in 15, but the boss still needs this pallet delivered to the back of Warehouse 3 before that happens. But I, like most normal people, know the difference between entertainment for all ages and entertainment aimed at a so-called adult audience. Uh-huh. Master Skywalker, there are too many of them. What are we going to do? Jamuri, no jo, we do I'm sure that exactly one of these scenes is not suitable for children. What is going on at Disney? Why do they care so little for the people that made them the company they are? <laughs> Walt must be spinning in his cryo chamber at the death of creativity and family entertainment. Ah yes, Walt Disney, the creator of such original and creative works such as The Little Mermaid, The Jungle Book, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, Alice in Wonderland and apparently Star Wars. Anyway, we're not here to dissect Hollywood and its bizarre view of women. God, I'd hate it for this video to go off topic. If Disney had the same control and attitude over the movie industry in the 80s as they do now, we would have never seen films like Robocop, Blade Runner, Terminator, The Running Man, Escape from the Mule, They Live, The Flock. Because I just did that video. But Disney's selling the idea that any genre can be and should be placed under the Star Wars banner is not only ridiculous, it's also lazy. What the fuck? 
They may as well make a hard adult version of The Wizard of Oz. People who say they want a more adult version of Star Wars, or a more serious version, are really saying, I just want more shows that feature my toys. That is Cap. That is fucking Cap. This man is spouting Cap, falsehoods, untruths, fictitious stories. He made it up. It was never real. He said something that did not exist. His citation, it came to him in a fucking dream. Regardless of quality or tone. I don't know what happened. It's a marketing team's wet dream. Grab any script, have a TIE fighter fly past, and we're all good to go. Ah uh, yeah, the TIE fighter that has shown up for the first time in four episodes and is located near an Imperial base, currently holding a quarterly payroll for an entire sector. I can see why you're upset that the ship gets used. The Empire is quite well known for its diversity of vehicles and ships, especially for basic guards and troopers. Growing up, we'd watch the Star Wars movies. Yeah! Then we'd switch over to Battlestar Galactica, Doctor Who might be on, or Ark 2, maybe even reruns of Logan's Run, or Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Could have been Star Trek that was going to fill up your night. We watched them all. Cool story, didn't ask, and I don't see how this is relevant. Because they all had a different look, flavour, and feel. Let's go getting down. The language was different, the stories were different, the fucking villains were different. It wasn't always the bloody Empire. Find important. Taking something of real value from the Empire. Wait, do you mean to tell me that completely different IPs had completely different stories and characters and villains and settings and ships and languages and plots and even different shows? They weren't all just Star Wars? That's fucking insane! I didn't realise that watching other IPs would mean that I wouldn't have the exact same setting as the one we are currently discussing. That is a very good point, I'm sure you must be proud. Well done, Robot. Head. Each offered something original. Star Trek didn't look like Doctor Who. Star Wars didn't look like Blade Runner. Well, now it does. Now it looks exactly like Blade Runner. And 2001. Robot Head, didn't you actually congratulate Andor for looking superb? Why are you complaining that it takes influence from other media as if other media didn't also take influence from Star Wars? As if Star Wars itself wasn't influenced by other works of fiction? Why is this a hill you want to die on? Tony Gilroy and his team have managed to expand the galaxy to incorporate planets with very unique and distinct styles and art direction. Yet you are complaining about it because it reminds you of other films. Is this really where we are at with criticism from people who are only famous because they shat on the fifth bad Star Wars film to come out, while not managing to move on and grow or expand their view on media? What a joke. And about 20 other movies it's ripping off. It's hard to believe Star Wars changed the look of cinema. Ah uh, yeah, 20 entire films, yet you could only give one example. An example which in of itself takes direct inspiration from Star Wars of all things for its main character. According to SlashFilm.com, Andrew Staten, the director of WALL-E, based WALL-E sounds off an astromech droid like R2-D2. He even went so far as to enlist the help of Ben Burt, the sound designer and voice actor for R2-D2 to help create the sounds WALL-E would make in the film. Despite not being able to communicate in full words, many robotic characters in the film lack anything but personality, which is owed to the talents of one man, sound designer and voice actor Ben Burt. The very same person behind the enthusiastic bips and howling beeps of perhaps one of the most famous droids in cinema, R2-D2. The voices he gives the characters in WALL-E are as irreplaceable as the animations of the robots themselves. It's the unique noises of WALL-E, or Eve, that I imagine hearing first before or picturing them. And, somehow, director and co-writer Andrew Stanton managed to wrangle Burt into doing far more extensive work than he'd ever done on a Star Wars. Yet, without him, there's a good chance Wally would have been a much different film, one absent of the indelible and lifelike temperaments he gives every robot he voices. Other prominent influences would include 2001 A Space Odyssey, Silent Running, Logan Sprunt, and Soylent Green. Yet I imagine you wouldn't take issue with Wall-E doing this since you likely enjoy that film and think it was well made. It just makes you a hypocrite. And now all they do is copy other cinema. If Disney had the same control and attitude over the movie industry in the 80s as they do now, we would have never seen films like Robocop, Blade Runner, Terminator, The Running Man, Escape from New York, They Live, The Fly, Repo Man, Tron, even E.T. Well, we might have got those films, but they would have been watered down, stretched out, and completely boring. I 
don't care, honestly. This is a nothing argument and is not at all connected to the quality of Andor itself. We may not have dissected Hollywood's view on women, but that doesn't mean we didn't just teeter off the fucking edge of relevancy. But the modern Disney consumer would be happy because it would have Star Wars in the title. And they would get to see things they recognize to keep them in their safe place. There it is. There's the little rascal. I knew we couldn't get more than 10 minutes in without seeing you again. Come here, you. No, but like, actually get over yourself. This film is almost seven years old. Move the fuck on. How many people do you think would be applauding Andor if it was a new franchise and not under the Star Wars banner? Again, just a complete nothing of a point. There is no reason to ask this question because Tony Gilroy was working with previous pitches that were given for Andor as a show. In a recent interview, Tony Gilroy details how he ended up writing Andor for Lucasfilm. It's actually a pretty interesting story to read. It turns out that Gilroy was given access to previous pitches for the show, probably because he wrote Rogue One, or parts of it. Lucasfilm wanted something that dealt with Cassian's earlier years and invited pitches. Gilroy wrote a criticism of one pitch and said what he would have done in its place. Lucasfilm liked the idea so much they asked him to make it. The rest, as they say, is history, and Gilroy crafted one of the best pieces of Star Wars media in 40 years. Why do we need to look at hypothetical situations for something that likely wouldn't have happened? Why not look at the renewed interest in Star Wars as an IP from people who were getting annoyed with how stale and stagnant the content was getting? Why not pine for more of the show or at least material that is of a similar standard? You could still have your space wizards and magic fuck off sand dragons, but have them be in a good show, with good writing and made by people who actually care about the small things. Not just trying to appease the people who have been consuming the same shit for the last 40 years and haven't exactly come to terms with the reality that they are no longer in fucking middle school. At the pace it's going and the choice of lead character i'd say not many womp, womp. i do like how the terms mature and grown up are used by journalists to feign intelligence when discussing a show that's unbearably slow and boring <laughs> the films i mentioned robocop blade runner terminator the running man escape from new york they live the fly repo man were all made and rated for adults and they're all a blast to watch Yes, I'm sure they were all entertaining in their own right. I myself am a big fan of Robocop and Terminator 1 and 2. They are nothing like Andor. Not in tone, not in setting, not even in approach or presentation. They aren't even the same genre. They aren't even the same medium of entertainment. Andor is a fucking TV show with 12 episodes that are an hour-ish long. If every episode had the pace of one of these films, the show would have been a muddled and confused mess. If they tried to integrate an action scene into every episode, it wouldn't work with the espionage angle the show is going for. It's meant to be slow. It's meant to emphasize character intelligence and dialogue not just their physical capabilities. That's why the show is considered to be mature and more adult, because adolescents don't tend to enjoy this type of content all too much. They prefer their media to have all the bells and whistles to keep them distracted long enough for mom and dad to finish filing the divorce. Game of Thrones was not made for the kids. If you have to make an adult version of Star Wars, why not something closer to that? Politics, battles, murder, sex, dragons, heads exploding. You know, actual fun things to watch. But they did. You just went on a massive tangent about Andor not being suitable for kids because it has adult content in the first episode. What? And Andor as a show, while not nearly as explicit, still has all of these elements. Sex is present without the nudity. Violence is present but doesn't contain much blood. And there is plenty of politics. The thing with Andor is that it's very approachable with its subject matter. You can show this to a younger audience and they can understand the implications of these scenes without them being explicitly shown. Unlike Game of Thrones. Why would Disney try to make a hard R-rated TV show for Star Wars? How would that ever be a good thing for them to do? And you could just remove the sex and heads exploding and replace the swords with lightsabers and it wouldn't be just for the adults everyone could have fun watching it but that's exactly what they did you bulbous bumbling buffoon just because it doesn't have lightsabers doesn't mean the serotonin in your body needs to be used to spout such vile fucking rubbish the show has received almost universal levels of praise from people who watch it and share their experiences on twitter and they all funnily enough share the exact same moments of the show which they consider to be their favorites and let me tell you something mr too stupid to understand nuance not a single one of these scenes would have been improved if they contained fucking lightsabers the show actually gets improved if you 
do remove the lightsabers Luthen uses during his space battle, because this type of goofy shit doesn't belong in the show and actually makes it worse. Go back to Mando to keep those Pokies addicted boomers happy, please and thank you. No, grown up Star Wars has to put the most boring and forgettable character into a boring and slow show where very little happens. We're robbing the armory at the Aldani garrison. Just how many fucking times are you going to say something only to immediately fuck it up with a clip from the show? Jesus thumb sucking Christ. A high story. How many times are we going to repeat the same idea? It's always getting in and out of some base or ship. That's why they only keep a 40 man regiment in the garrison. Because they know no one's stupid enough to try it. I don't see any shields. That's because no one will be stupid enough to attack. Hello, false equivalency, my old friend. Let's discuss these two scenes that Gladys the Space Wheel thought would be a good idea to compare. In Andor, they are discussing plans for breaking into the vault on Aldani and are explaining the plan to Cassian. They mention to him that their plan involves escaping on a box freighter through the runway tunnel and ask if he can pilot the vessel. Cassian points out that the plan is flawed because the TIE fighters that you mentioned earlier as just being pointless fan service are in actuality quite capable of catching them within mere minutes of escape. Because of this fact, Cassian points out that their plan is a suicide mission, to which Vel says, It's a suicide run. Exactly. That's why they only keep a 40-man regiment in the garrison. Because they know no one's stupid enough to try it. No one but us. The men at this garrison are aware that they possess the means to secure this facility with only that number, something Cassian points out when he says, Because they know no one's stupid enough to try it because the only way out of the garrison is through the use of a box freighter that can be caught mere moments after it leaves. It makes a successful robbery of this garrison practically impossible, which is why these characters plan their heist out so carefully and is precisely why they discuss it so frequently. It relies on very specific instruction and very clear direction. One slip up could mean their deaths. These are intelligent individuals who planned around impossible odds and a character like Andor is shown to be stern and direct when it comes to securing his safety. He makes it very clear to the group early on, in their planning, that if it's him who puts his ass on the line then he will be the one to manage their escape. The reason why he says this is because he figures out that the group doesn't actually know how to calibrate the weight of the freight in order to secure an escape, and his reaction is very appropriate. What were you gonna do if I wasn't here? Might have been ugly, but we'd have figured it out. We wanted to be sure. No. Oh, okay. I'll pilot. No, you'll do as you're told. I I'm flying it. We can say it's your idea, I don't care, but if it's my ass on the line, I'm pulling this thing out of there. Okay. Okay. Now, per contra, let's have a look at the scene in Kenobi. Obi-Wan and his team are attempting to break into the Inquisitor's castle, a not-so-secret base of operations for the main force-wielding faction of the galaxy at this current moment in time. Why are they doing this? Don't know. Go watch Madvocate's video to find out. The reason why this plan is kinda shite is because they are basing it off of very loose information that they acquired as quickly as possible and relies on a level of convenience hitherto undreamt of. The secret base of the Inquisitors, the galaxy's fucking Jedi hunters, doesn't have an active shield around the base, which means you could bombard it from fucking orbit anytime you wanted and kill several members of this faction as easily as taking a shit after adding the extra spicy mayo to your ham sandwich. What makes it worse is that this exact same facility was shown in the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order video game, which is apparently canon to the rest of the events in the Star Wars lore, and in that game, the facility does actually have a shield, and Cal Kestis, the main character of the game, still broke in. And this game apparently takes place BEFORE the show does, and the Inquisitors just kind of forgot that they actually are people stupid enough to do this, which makes this this scene even worse as a result, because fuck you. You see the difference? The dumbass Disney writers have two, maybe three ideas they keep rotating. Force Awakens, enter Star Killer Base undetected to turn something off. Everything goes wrong. Rogue One, go undercover to enter Scarif Base undetected to steal plans. Everything goes wrong. Last Jedi, go undercover to enter Snoke's ship to turn something off. Everything goes wrong. Solo a Star Wars story, go undercover to steal an Empire ship and then go undercover to steal Coaxium. Everything goes wrong. The Mandalorian. Go undercover to enter an Imperial base and steal information. Everything goes wrong. Rise of Skywalker. Enter Kylo's ship undetected to steal Chewie. Everything goes wrong. The Book of Boba Fett. Enter Jabba's palace undetected to steal Slave One. Everything goes wrong. Obi-Wan Kenobi. Go undercover to enter Fortress Inquisitorious to steal Leia. 
everything goes wrong. The Phantom Menace. Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan break into the Naboo Palace to steal Padme from the Trade Federation. Everything goes wrong. Attack of the Clones. Anakin and Padme attempt to sneak into the Genosis factory to rescue Obi-Wan. Everything goes wrong. Revenge of the Sith. Anakin and Obi-Wan attempt to break into General Grievous' starship to rescue the Chancellor. Everything goes wrong. A New Hope. Luke and his friends sneak into the Death Star to rescue Princess Leia. Everything goes wrong. Empire Strikes Back. Luke sneaks into Cloud City to rescue his friends. Everything goes wrong. Return of the Jedi. Han and Leia try to sneak into a base on Endor to shut down the Death Star shield generators. Everything goes wrong. Man, if only those Lucas writers managed to make something original, then maybe we wouldn't have such terrible films. Good job. Endor, go undercover to an Imperial base to steal money. Could it be possible that everything will go wrong? We're not prepped for this. We have an extra uniform. Gonna need to leave us your belt and gloves. That's nine for nine. Uh, actually, that's 15 for 15. I'm glad we're finally getting something new in Star Wars. It's a suicide run. Exactly. Goats with four horns. AK-47s. They've let their imaginations go wild with this one. Hmm. A horn's pistol is a Mauser C96. This has always been a thing. And or early reactions call it complex, mature, and the best Star Wars spin-off series so far. Grown-up noir thriller makes for the best Star Wars show yet. Five stars. All of these headlines are correct, by the way. Every single one. NME should look up the meanings to grown-up, noir, and thriller. Because they don't mean what you think they do. Grown-up adjective. Not childish or immature. Adult of, for, or characteristic of adults, insisted on wearing grown-up clothes. Grown-up, noun, adult, noir, noun, crime fiction featuring hard-boiled cynical characters and bleak sleazy settings, an example of classic noir, film noir, a comedy dressed in the trappings of an edgy noir. Noir. Adjective. Having a bleak and darkly cynical quality of the kind associated with hard-boiled crime fiction and film noir. A noir thriller. Thriller. Noun. One that thrills. Especially a work of fiction or drama designed to hold the interest by the use of a high degree of intrigue, adventure, or suspense. Differs from every Star Wars series before it in the best ways. Yes, removing any sense of fantasy, excitement, or fun does make this show differ from the other Star Wars content. I agree with this headline, and if you think that's what needs to be done in order to get good Star Wars content again, then hey man, I agree. Shell's got a shell. He says in a video that featured a paid sponsorship. Ah oh, well, who knows? This high storyline could be the greatest Star Wars idea ever. I don't know about best, but it's pretty fucking close. And I might even see something I recognise. Fighter. One time is funny, two times is fucking annoying, no? Come on, Andor. You can't just look good. You've got to actually do something. I want you all to keep this in mind. Robot Head has only been discussing, and I use that word very loosely, the first four episodes of Andor, which means he dipped that at the start of the Adani arc, and yet he is surprised that nothing happened. Yet. Completely ignoring the fallout at the end of Act 1 and the consequences that Andor's actions in Episode 1 created. But I guess when you spend all your viewing time trying to look for lightsabers instead of paying attention to any of the dialogue on screen, you tend to miss a thing or two. They know no one's stupid enough to try it. No one but us. That video is painful. But at least it's over now. Robot Head, you suck. 
This low effort, demented, IQ mosh bit of a video is exactly the kind of thing I've come to expect from content like this. Barely any substance to your arguments, bone dry appeals to children for the sake of seeming holier than thou, and just the most basic bitch pot shots at TLJ, because of course you would. It's like members of the boomer tubers who still complain about Brie Larson. You people have no originality, so I am not surprised that your arguments about Andor being unoriginal just comes off as laughable. And thankfully, the people in your comments section seem to think you were missing with this one too, so maybe not all is lost. Thank you all so much for watching through this and being so patient with me. I know I've made several promises that I haven't kept this year, but I am trying. If this video does well, then I might consider covering his opinion on Across the Spider-Verse. So if you'd wish to see that, then don't forget to like and subscribe and comment down below your favorite brand of cheese. Till then, this is your friendly neighborhood Shandy saying take care and see you next time. Leonard likes this post.